Hey everyone, welcome back to our walkthrough of the book of Acts. And now we hit a new chapter and truly a new phase of our narrative as we begin what I used to call in the sermon series way back when, The Great Adventures of Paul. Today we begin Paul's first missionary journey in chapter 13. And we start today with verses 1 through 12. I'm excited because this is really such an action packed interesting and very moving part of the book of Acts, not that any of the rest is not, but it is really when you think of Acts, most of the time we think of Paul's journeys to spread the gospel to faraway lands. Well, we begin that part of the narrative here today. So let's go ahead and open with our prayer and we'll dive in with a couple of things that I need to share with you to kind of set up our discussion as we go forward, but our prayer first. Let the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. All right, so let's go ahead, open your Bibles, your apps, or follow along here on the screen. Let's read our verses for today, chapter 13, verses 1 through 12. Now in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, a member of the court of Herod, the ruler, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. They had John also to assist them. When they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they met a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man who summoned Barnabas and Saul and wanted to hear the word of God. But the magician Elymas, for that is the translation of his name, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul, also known as Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, You son of the devil! You enemy of all righteousness, full of all deceit and villainy, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? And now listen, the hand of the Lord is against you, and you will be blind for a while, unable to see the sun. Immediately mist and darkness came over him, and he went about groping for someone to lead him by the hand. The proconsul saw what had happened, he believed, for he was astonished at the teaching about the Lord. All right, you ready? Here we go. Before we dive into this text, let me, a couple of minutes. So throughout this series, whenever we have had geography be a part of the lesson, we have put up maps and just giving you snippets of the maps because for the most part, we've stayed in the land of Palestine We've stretched out to Caesarea and then further north to Antioch. But as you just heard, and as if you've read ahead, you know very well, the gospel is now expanding far beyond the bounds of where it has traditionally been proclaimed. And as such, maps are going to become much more important. So a couple of things. Number one, when we get to verse four in our lesson today, I'm going to have not only the map put up, but Elizabeth Pack, who is our brilliant star producer for these videos of mine, who gets all the graphics and put, makes it look nice beyond my very raw video that I send her. I've asked her to leave the map up on the screen for you, and I'm going to be relegated to a little box somewhere at the corner, wherever Elizabeth thinks it works, or whatever the map looks like. Because, as you already have figured out with Acts, geography is very important because the gospel is proclaimed in a given place at a given time to a given set of people. So to really understand that, 
you need a map. Unless you've been to southern Turkey yourself, or you've written a thesis on history of the ancient Middle East, most of this will not really make all that much sense unless you can see on a map where Paul is traveling. Because not only does it help you to know where these places are, it actually you can see a pattern and a purpose behind his missionary journey. So here as we start the first missionary journey, the map that's going to pop up a little bit later in this episode is one that you're going to see for the next several days because the first missionary journey goes on through most of chapter 14. So we'll be on this map for a while. So I just want you to know that map will be up. I also encourage you, though, if you want to have your own map, a lot of Bibles have maps in them. And if your Bible has a map, I'm pretty sure it's going to have a map of Paul's missionary journeys. Now, it may be one map with all three journeys on it, which is a little confusing because you have to pick out what's the right color and it gets a little bit tangled up with the lines retracing over each other. Um, but if that's what you got, that's what you got. I also encourage you, as, as I've done with the maps that you see, just go to Google and in this case, type in map of Paul's first missionary journey. Make sure you say first because there are three and they're all very different. Map of Paul's first missionary journey. And you can print that out, have it in front of you. I just strongly encourage you, whether it's the map we put up on the screen or it's a map that's in front of you, that you have a map as we go through this. So if you don't want to follow the video, I'd go ahead and pause this video. If you don't want to follow the map that I put up, in other words, or Elizabeth puts up, pause this video, go and find you a map, either on the Internet or in your own Bible. Have that ready and then resume and hit play. You got it? All right. Now, second thing is just kind of a setup from where we left off yesterday, and that, of course, was from the fact that after Peter had escaped, after Herod had died, that awful death, verse 24 of chapter 12, the word of God continued to advance and gain adherence, and then we get this setup for today. After completing their mission, Barnabas and Saul returned to Jerusalem and brought with them John, whose other name was Mark, their mission. So now here in 13, it's set up that oh, they're back in Antioch. So clearly from the narrative, well, maybe not, but it, it's pretty evident that there is a gap of time between the end of chapter 12, chapter 13. Barnabas, remember when he came to Antioch that first time, it said that they were there for a year proclaiming the word and teaching and raising up the church at Antioch. And so it says when their mission is complete, that means they went back to Jerusalem to report the home base. He took Saul with him and took John Mark with him. So when we start here in chapter 13, it just says here they are in Antioch. So now as we get into the text, now in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. Remember, prophets were those who were sent out claim the word of God, who were missionary in their very nature. Teachers could be a prophet, could be people who stay at home, though, to, uh, it, it's, could, it, it likely is very close to an elder, as we talked about, but there also is some overlap, the fact that teacher might be somebody who's appointed for that special role. And if you go through Paul's letters, particularly in his letters where he talks about spiritual gifts, a teacher is a particular spiritual gift. So Luke is aware of this more than likely. And for him, teacher is probably more aligned with what Paul's talking about in his own letters. So just so you know these roles. But it's very interesting here, these people who were mentioned. Barnabas, Simeon, also called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, a member of the court of Herod the ruler, or Herod the Tetrarch. I mentioned that yesterday when we talked about Herod, that would actually refer to Herod Antipas, the Herod who was the ruler when John was beheaded and when Jesus was crucified, not Herod Agrippa, because he was the one who started the Tetrarch or inherited it, and Saul. Very interesting quote that I think is very important for understanding both the the, the demographics of the church in Antioch, but also the mission of this church. 
And this is a quote, and, and I'm just going to read the quote because it's a lot better coming from him, but Gerhard Crodel, who is a German theologian who wrote a commentary on the book of Acts, writes that he gives a description of this role of names of the people who were part of this church. He says, the role of names are a Levite, from Cyprus, Barnabas, a black man, Simeon, also called Niger, a North African from Cyrene, Lucius, a boyhood friend of Herod Antipas, and a Pharisee educated under Gamaliel. All of these people were acknowledged to be, as he says, spiritual dynamos in the church at Antioch. So very, very important detail, the diversity of the church at Antioch. This is not some monolithic, homogenous group of people. This is a very diverse and ethnic group of people. That doesn't matter in the sense that that's, you know, hey, we're trying to get that. It matters because it's representative of all these different places and all these different people. It is a flashing red light, or green light, that the gospel is about to be proclaimed to all sorts of different people. The church at Antioch already reflects that in its makeup. Uh, everything from someone who's a part of the royal court, or grew up in the royal court, I should say, in Menaean, to a Levite, Barnabas, if you remember, from Cyprus, who uh, the Levite was the priestly tribe within the nation of Israel. So Barnabas comes from that good stock. Saul, who comes from the court of Gamaliel, who was one of the great Pharisees, one of the most highly regarded teachers within Judaism. And then a North African and a black man and, again, a royal figure. That's a pretty good demographic of the Mediterranean world of that day and age. So that sets up what's about to happen in verse 2. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, very important to know what they were doing when they hear the Holy Spirit speak to them. They were engaged in their life as people who were disciples of Jesus, who were saints of the church. Worship and fasting. The Holy Spirit says, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work of to which I have called them. Very interesting word set apart. It's a word which often refers to setting apart what's clean from what's unclean. It's a word that Paul himself uses in a couple of his letters, Romans, the most notable of chapter one, verse one, where he says, Paul set apart to be an apostle of God. God has called him and set him apart for this special work. The irony is it yeah, originally is used as a word to denote separating what's clean from unclean. They're being set apart to go to the, quote, unclean people and the unclean regions of the world to proclaim the gospel to this very diverse group of people that they're going to, to do. So Barnabas and Saul are called, but then the call does, is not like, well, let's just go. There's some preparation that takes place. Then after fasting, and praying. Well, fasting is not, well, it's fast for 10 minutes. Fasting implies, you know, this was over a period of several days, maybe weeks. So there was some preparation that went into this. After fasting and praying, there we go with prayer again, the activity of the church. Finally, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. The apostles in Jerusalem were the ones who laid hands on before, but notice now that power has now been brought to the church in Antioch. So the work of Saul and Barnabas, in this case, is not only commissioned by the Holy Spirit, but is given the sign of the Spirit's commission with the laying on of hands, the conveying of the Spirit from those in authority to those going out to do the work of prophet, missionary, prophetic missionary work. So with that being said, Time for the map. So Elizabeth's going to throw up the map here, going to put me in a little box somewhere on here. You can still look at me, but you can follow along in your text and you can follow along on the map in particular. So verse four, so being sent out by the Holy Spirit, 
they went down to Seleucia. So on your map, you see they're coming from Antioch. And notice, by the way, there's two Antiochs on your map, and we'll get to the other Antioch. But the Antioch that they're in is, again, the one that's on the, the right side of your map that's due north, essentially, of Jerusalem. Whenever in doubt, look at the island of Cyprus, and you see the pointer. That What it's pointing at is it's pointing right at Antioch, which is this Antioch that is the base of operations for these missionary journeys. So they go from Antioch to Seleucia, which is the coastal city closest to it, or the major port, and they set sail and go to Cyprus. When they arrive at Salamis, which is the, not Salami, but Salamis, which is on the eastern side of the island, one of the major ports, they proclaim the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. One of the things I, I wouldn't have picked up on except in the commentary that I read is when you read it carefully, you realize synagogues of the Jews. Doesn't that sound redundant? It was a reminder to me of a little lesson that synagogue is not a unique Jewish entity. A synagogue in Greek simply means a place of gathering or, or a place where people come together, not necessarily for worship, but where people come together. So when it says a Jewish synagogue, now that we're out in Gentile world especially, it is important to differentiate that because um, sometimes Roman gymnasiums could be referred to as synagogues, but there's all sorts of different things, all the way from religious places to gathering places for social events to whatever it is where people gather together can be called synagogue. So just a little trivia there for you to know. And a little note in verse 5, and they had John also to assist them. So John Mark is with them. Not for long. You're going to see that tomorrow. But just a little note that John's there helping them out. It doesn't say much what they do other than they proclaim the word in the synagogues at Salamis. What is more important in this particular episode is when they go to the western side of the island. In verse 6, they had gone through the whole island. So they go from the eastern port all the way to the western port of Paphos, which is the primary western port, but also the provincial capital of the island of Cyprus. And there they meet a certain magician a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. Let's say a couple of things about this first. First of all, um, Paphos in of itself was a fairly significant city, not just being a provincial capital and a port, but you can imagine where it's located in the Mediterranean. It, it's a connecting point for ships needing a stop-off point. So there, it's a, there's a strong Jewish presence there, but there's also a significant number of Gentiles who were in Paphos, as it is a truly crossroads place for that section of the world. You may be conjuring in your mind the image of the magician Simon, that Philip runs into in Samaria during his mission there, and that would be on purpose. This is an allusion to a previous story, although, again, it is in Luke's mind an actual historical event, but it has connotations with the story that we heard before. It also needs to be said a Jewish false prophet. Now, again, I, I stress that Acts and Luke in particular are not anti-Semitic. This is not an attack on, on Jews. What is happening here is that their Luke, who actually in this case is, is, is taking a defense of Judaism, there was an allegation made by Gentiles in this day and age that Jews and Christians alike, as they start to emerge, have this magical element to them. And there were those who claimed within the realm of Judaism or in Christianity to have special magical powers. Well, this is a magician who claims to be Jewish, but you know what Luke is really trying to convey here is that it's somebody who really is not Jewish, but he's using it to say that he has some sort of special authority. Plus, he calls himself Jewish. He carries authority with people in the synagogues. So his name is Bar-Jesus, ironically. Uh, Jesus, again, was not an uncommon name in Judaism of that time. Bar is an Aramaic word which means son of, so it's son of Jesus. Bar Timaeus is another example of that in the Gospels, in Mark's Gospel, Bar Timaeus, son of Timaeus. So it says he was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man, blink, blink, also a Gentile, 
who summoned Barnabas and Saul and wanted to hear the word of God. Ah, a showdown's about to take place here. And here's one of the most significant features of the showdown is set up in verse 8. Again, you may not read this just from a casual read. The magician Elymas gives the translation of his name. So Bar-Jesus Elymas is his Greek name. Opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul, also known as Paul, ah, here's where his name turns finally from Saul to Paul. Well, Saul's a Jewish name. Paul is a Greek name. It's no accident that his Greek name is now becomes his regular name as he enters into his Gentile ministry. But here, as he opposes this false prophet of the Jewish faith, whose Gentile name is now given, because here they are in the arena trying to win over a Gentile who is of great prominence. And it makes it clear, Saul, Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him. When the crippled man in chapter 3, Peter and John, looked intently at him. Or a hole with, you, with my eyes. That is a sign that some deed of power is about to take place. And again, with the Holy Spirit, Paul looks at him and says, You son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, Full of all deceit and villainy, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? That's a criticism directed to a Jew, who is somebody who claims, although very tenuously with his record as a magician, to be part of the nation of Israel. And now the hand of the Lord is against you, and you will be blind for a while. Paul knows a thing or two about blindness, doesn't he? So the very thing that helped him to see the faith actually now something's used to punish someone who clearly is not attentive to the faith, has no desire, at least from the story, to repent, and his blindness, instead of an entrance into conversion, is instead a condemnation for his actions. And it just says he went about groping for someone to lead him by the hand. Here is another example of a power of, of a sign and a wonder that is used to convey the authority that the apostles have. Um, and it says, verse 12, when the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed, for he was astonished at the teaching about the Lord. Well, amazement says the proconsul converts. He is amazed and he sees the authority of Paul take place. One of the things is a preview of what's to come. Paul, for as persuasive a speaker as he is, doesn't always convert everybody. It is notable that he always makes a very strong impression upon the people that he speaks with, but it doesn't always lead to conversion. But he has asserted his authority. And in the meantime, it is implied that while he's here in this, he has been engaged in the teaching of the synagogue, just as he was up at Salami. So he has made inroads within the synagogues there. Of course, keep in mind that Cyprus was one of the places that sent missionaries to Antioch and helped to establish the church there. So it's not like the gospel is new to a lot of the people in Cyprus, but now here comes Paul who is proclaiming it with great power and authority, even as such that even the previous followers of the way have not seen. And he is coming to win over disciples and converts and shift them to the way that is to be found in Jesus. So I have hit my time limit for today. Thank you for bearing with me that this is a little longer. Um, come back now off the map, but I just want to say that Keep reading ahead beyond our lesson for tomorrow, which tomorrow we make sure is 13 through 25. Chapter 13, verses 13 through 25 is our reading for tomorrow as we go now out of Cyprus into what is now modern day Turkey, or what was called then the region of Asia Minor. And we're going to get to see Paul's missionary journey continue and see snippets of events in which Paul has great success and also has great persecution. 
because of the message that he conveys. A lot I know that I've not gotten to in this text. I'm sitting here thinking of five things I want to share with you we didn't get to. May touch on one of those tomorrow. I emphasize if you have any questions, comments, or anything, send them to me, and I would love to hear from you on that. Until tomorrow, take care. May the peace of the Lord be with you.